In this Climate Gen episode, I'm speaking with hydrologist Dr. Francesco Avanzi at the SEMA Institute in Liguria, Italy, about the worsening multi year drought that Italy is experiencing. But Italy is not alone. The Graz University of Technology recently analysed groundwater data across Europe and concluded that Europe is lacking in groundwater a lot and has been in a state of severe drought since 2018. Even in the UK, hydrologists are warning that rivers, where not polluted by sewage dumping, are at very low levels and that drought poses a massive risk to agriculture and drinking water. In France, the drought conditions are severely dire. President Macron recently stated that the era of water abundance has come to an end. Moves to address leakage and overuse from agriculture are now being undertaken. In Spain, drought is not new, but it is experiencing extreme condition in specific areas. Catalonia is one area where water sources are severely depleted and new laws have been enacted to restrict usage. In Italy, a new super commissioner for water has been announced to tackle the nationwide drought, posing a problem for agriculture, viticulture, as well as domestic supply. Speaking about these drought conditions, Dr. Francesco Avanzi said, Droughts are often called the creeping disaster because at the very beginning you don't realize that it's coming up. And when you realize that it's often too late, and in that, the dynamic is somehow similar to how the COVID pandemic played out in the early months, that awareness came when somehow it was already too late. I was in Liguria, Italy last summer, and the drought conditions were apparent. Fountains were switched off, seagulls parched, and rumours of tighter restrictions were circulating. Driving from Spain to France in December 22, through the foothills of the Pyrenees, we were met with the bewildering spectacle of a dried-out reservoir, the exposed barren mudflats and boating jetty surreally extending into the dryness. Europe is losing its groundwater, and this has profound implications for all of us who are based here. I think it's important to realise that there are some aspects of global warming that are already around us, and we should be concerned and try to find uh, solutions to that. What we have seen in, in Italy, in Europe in particular, is a combination of some processes that are certainly already in the scenarios that we have been designing over the last few decades in terms of increasing temperature, warmer conditions. Across the Alpine region in particular, this has translated in significant snow deficit. I spoke with Francesco in November 2022 and then again in January 2023, as the lack of snowpack in the Alps and Apennines signalled high risk of further drought in the coming year. We observed significantly warmer fall and early winter across the board. In terms of the meteorological drought, so the rainfall deficit, we saw per partial recovery. But given these very warm temperatures, we experienced at least a plus one degree more than usual over the, the course of 2022, which overall translated from my standpoint in a very late start of the snow season, several weeks later than usual. The snowpack built quite and then uh, a heat wave between December and January that we have about one third of the snow that we are used to have by this time of the year at national level, both in the Alps and in central Italy. So this is a significant difference from last year. The deficit is across the whole country and is really driven by these high temperatures that we have seen over the course of the last few weeks. Okay, you just mentioned the whole country, but if we just take um, the Alps, for example, how does that deficit connect to something like the Po River Basin in terms of water supplies? You sort of look forward into the into 2023. Well, at the Alpine level right now, we are about minus 60, minus 66 percent in terms of the volume of water that we had in, in, in snow over the last 13 years. So a significant deficit. Part of that could be filled uh, with this more snow coming. But again, snow accumulation is a cumulative process. It starts in November and most of the precipitation comes in, in, in the fall and in spring, not really in January or February or March. So in terms of water resources, again, on the one hand, it is still early. As, as we all know, the snow that we accumulate in the mountains then is water that we use in spring and summer in the rivers. So if, if it is not filled up, then we will have a, a, yet another deficit like last year, especially in April and May when the bulk of snow melt 
uh, goes downstream in, in the in the Po River, and 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 all the rivers that feed feed it. So what you could say is this cumulative process is is kind of under a great deal of stress, and the, as as this kind of progresses, you're seeing less water feeding into the groundwaters yeah. and into the the river. Absolutely, basin. that's a very important point, especially because the snow uh, feeds rivers, but it is a slow process, so it is very efficient in infiltrating in the soil and from there to the groundwater. And so if we miss snow in the mountains, uh, we also miss this connection to groundwater that then is used um, to cope with the drought periods in, in, in summer. What I noticed in the information you were putting out in the public, you weren't just talking about the Alps, you were also talking about the Apennines and the Marque and Abruzzo. Can, can you talk about just a little bit about how much stress uh, that area is under? Uh, right now, we see uh, even larger deficit down there. Uh, I checked the numbers over the last few days. Uh, we, we have deficit on the order of minus 80, some, somewhere minus 90% compared to um, the last 13 years, which were still quite warm. So the benchmark we are taking is over quite warm years already. On the one hand, the bulk of snowfall in the area comes in January, February, and March. So on the one hand, there is still time in the Apennines, much more than in the Alps, to fill this deficit. It's a different climate to some extent. On the other hand, the, the main issue with the Apennines is that they don't have glacier supply. And so in the Alps, we can somehow cope with the dry weather by using glacier melt. Given that there is no glacier in, in central and southern Italy, snow really provides a big chunk of the total water that then is used, uh, especially in the, in the headwater basins, to um, feed agriculture and all the other uses during the much drier season in summer. So again, I think that's the main stress point that we will have to monitor over the next few weeks is really the, the snow reservoir in central Italy, given that it is a cornerstone of how they cope with water supply and during spring and summer. And it's a much larger deficit right now than in the Alps. Have you been able to put a number on it or quantify how big this deficit actually is? So at national level, we currently have about one third of the water volume in snow that we were used to have for this time of the year at national level. Then in the Alps, again, most of our snow in the Alps is in the Alps. So this deficit that I told you about the national level, it's very similar to the one we have in the Alps, one third. In the Apennines, more than that, minus 80, minus 90. Overall, in terms of water volume, it's a big number. We are currently missing about four giga cubic meter of water. Usually when a peak accumulation between March and April, we estimate we have about 13 giga cubic meter of, of water in snow at national level. We are currently missing four of them. I just wanted to, to clarify that that's billion. So that's, that's four billion cubic meters. Is that correct? Exactly. Sorry. It's four billion cubic meters. Sorry. Yeah. That was a scientific <laughs> lexicon. Yeah. Billion cub cubic meter, which is about, if, if, if your listeners are familiar with that, it's about 15% of Lago Maggiore in terms of volume in, in, in Northern Italy, just to give a, you know, a parallelism uh, of what we are missing at the moment. Again, it's it's early on, on the one hand, but it's certainly a deficit. Italy is a, a country with widespread agriculture. There's there's a lot of water demand. If this process continues, which it seems to be, you know, the trends are pointing in that direction. What are the challenges that you foresee in these scenarios? So there are two processes that are two mechanisms that will change uh, the way we are used to use water in alpine re regions. The first one is that we will have to cope with less snow across the board. So a decrease in water volume during the snow melt period coming from, from, from snow. Um, on the other hand, what we also see is a shift towards earlier snow seasons. So a later start 
are earlier meltout date. There are data from some colleagues of us from CNR that have just showed that the duration of the snow season right now is unprecedented over the last 600 years in the Alps. So that's also part of the problem. So this means that on one hand, we, we have to cope with less water from snow coming earlier than usual during spring. Uh, which means that we will have to rethink to some extent some of our practice in terms of uh, where and when we store water and when and how we use it. And the last year gave already quite a lot of lessons and I think to some extent it raised our awareness of changes that are happening and we will have to continue that adaptation and, and mitigation. This reminds us, as Francesco said at the outset, the drought is a creeping disaster. The water is stored as snow in the mountains. It runs down into the rivers, into the soils, and is stored beneath as groundwater. It is a mechanism that we regard as an infinite cycle. Human-made climate change is interrupting the cycle by erasing the source of the water. The snow that is not accumulating in a mountain during winter is water that we are not going to have during summer. That's when we need water the most for agriculture, for fresh water supply. And that translated into a significant stream flow deficit and so water supply issues all across the board. There are some ingredients in that in terms of warmer temperature, less snow and less water that are, as I said, part of broader picture of climate change that is unfolding. The atmospheric burden of greenhouse gases is so great that there is no known countervailing force that will reverse the loss of the snowpack. If heat waves persist across consecutive years, then pressure on groundwater increases. When it comes to alpine regions and areas that take water from groundwater, one single dry season might not be so evident than when we look at freshwater supply. So every citizen may then see very little precipitation. But then when you look at the groundwater, you still see water availability and you come up with a question. So was it so bad because we still have water in our soils, right? The point is that especially when we look at groundwater, so water in the ground, it, it takes a lot of years to adjust to climatic trends. So this year was particularly dry. We had nearly half of the precipitation that we were used to have. Groundwater is a savings account. We can take from that to cope with a single dry year. But then when we look at several dry years in a row, that reserve may dry up. So that's probably what I would be more interested in is in looking at the broader picture at a larger time scale. Counterintuitively, when we see years of drought, we also see increased risk of dangerous flooding from increased atmospheric moisture. As Francesco says, this creates an urgent need for rethinking how we capture and store water. In a warmer world, we will have more evaporation, so more water that goes into the atmosphere. That's the basic mechanism underlying a drier world. But then this moisture has to fall somewhere at, at some point, and that's why we see these extreme events in terms of flooding. Again, the paradigm that we have developed historically in terms of water infrastructures in areas like Italy, in particular in northern Italy, I'm thinking where I live, is really focusing on infrastructures to store water to some extent. But then we have this natural infrastructure made of the snowpack and glaciers that store water up in the mountains. And that is key to deliver that water when we need it the most in summer. This natural infrastructure is declining. And that means that we need to find new ways to cope with that and if not store that water, at least use the water we have more efficiently in terms, again, in how we use it, how we quantify requirements and how we formulate water management policy. This is a critical juncture in how we understand and adapt to a new way of thinking about water management. Whether we are using water for our business or for washing our face or nourishing our families, we all have to take care to ensure that we have water security going forward. What the first point that I think we learn as a country is that this is part of our everyday life. When we think about water, we now 
understand to a larger extent that it's a precious resource. And we hope that in the future, this will also translate into behavioral change. So of course, each and every one of us has to give more value to water. We use 200, sometimes even 300 liters per person every day, which is obviously a great deal. We also think that this summer, this year taught us that adaptation and climate change should really enter into decision-making and uh, planning projects. It's an endeavor where each and every one of us can play a role and where as a country and a community, we can adapt. That adaptation doesn't mean that mitigation is over. Many climate change scenarios show that if we are able to meet Paris Agreement goals, we will still be able to reduce the frequency and intensity of these extremes by a considerable amount. So there is obviously actions that must be taken at the community level and actions where each and every one can play a role. There are solutions, saving water, more smart agriculture, improved water resources management. I think the takeaway for, for the listeners is that there are actions going on. It's a long process, but there is rising awareness at all levels that these extremes are part of our everyday life here and in the decades to come. Have you been surprised at the speed of this, or is it roughly what you expected in in the broader context of warmer climate? So, yeah, it was somehow expected. We had scenarios that we made and our other colleagues of us across the country made about climate change impact. So to some extent, it fits very well into that story of increasing temperature, declining snowpack. There are observations across the Italian Alps, the Swiss Alps, showing a consistent decline in snow water sources. So it is part of that trend that we have already seen over the last decades. On the other hand, last year was quite unprecedented in terms of the intensity and extent of the process. I think it's part of a new normal that we have to get used to, to some extent. If I think about other regions of the world, California has also experienced similar processes in terms of a lack of snowpack and so a lack of water resources. Right now, California is experiencing one of the major flood events over the last decades. So really what we are seeing is a shift toward a more extreme weather where prolonged droughts then are followed by extreme flood events. The comparison with California should not be taken lightly. The multi-year drought has created legal disputes over rights to groundwater aquifers and raised many questions about farming the land sustainably. There has also been destructive flooding where torrential rainwater has fallen across land scorched hard from extreme wildfires in the heat waves. Here is former White House advisor Dr. Alice Hill speaking at COP27 in Glasgow. Well, first of all, we need broader recognition that it's smart to invest in risk reduction. The studies in the United States show that for every dollar we spend on risk reduction, we save about $11 in damages. And if we don't save a community, um, we see really cascading economic impacts that are not reflected in the economic modeling. I'll give you an example. In 2017 and 18, we had devastating wildfires in California. The town of Paradise, uh, a lower middle class town in the mountains of California, burned to the ground. Eight people died uh, and 20,000 people overnight were thrown into another adjoining town called Chico, California. Chico already suffered from affordable housing challenges, and suddenly 20,000 people appear with kindergartners who need to get enrolled in school, people looking for jobs, people looking for a place to live. Highly difficult situation for both those that have been displaced and the receiving communities. But the modeling doesn't really pick up beyond that economic dislocation to what else happened turned out that the fires got so hot that the piping underneath paradise melted, perhaps spreading toxic chemicals uh, to the water supply. We then saw uh, that the wildfire smoke caused health implications, increased asthma, increased respiratory disease, including all the way over to where I live in Washington, D.C. The smoke was that bad. 
And now we are having uh, a atmospheric river uh, has uh, dumped a lot of rain on California. And we're seeing mudslides because that very scarred area with intense heat from these wildfires that burn hotter makes the land so tough that the water, when it hits, just hits it and picks up boulders and everything else. And we have our reservoirs in the mountains uh, in California threatening our freshwater supplies. Alice went on to emphasize that when it comes to climate impacts, the past is no longer a reliable guide to the future. We need to learn and adapt in real time. Really what we are seeing is a shift toward a more extreme weather where prolonged droughts then are followed by extreme flood events. A Europe-wide water crisis is not just creeping, it is accelerating upon us. As the climate responds to our carbon dioxide emissions, we have to search for ways to adapt and survive in an ever more challenging world. The water topic is one I will be returning to again in future episodes. Thank you. <laughs>